as your will is done in heaven. We seek it also to be done here on this earth in our own lives. You gave your son a gift of life in his death, in his blood. A gift of life in his resurrection. A gift of life through his work as our high priest. And as we come before your throne, we seek to hear from your lips. We seek to understand, not from humanity's perspective, but from yours, from your throne. You know everything from the past, the present, and what is going to happen in the future. You have made it clear in your word. Only you can know. And so, Lord, we come to hear and we ask you to tabernacle with us. To send your guardian angels to bind every evil force that would want to disrupt and cause problems. Lord, we seek your shield around us. Amen to help in every aspect that your people can hear the message, whether they be here in this, your house, the very gate of heaven, or in their homes, some even under trees, wherever they may be, we have joined together by faith around your throne to hear your word. Speak to us now for your glory and honor, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning as we conclude chapter 7 of Daniel, we may need to find ourselves in a little need of review to find the context and importance of what God's revelations to Daniel was going on in chapter 7. As we know, chapter 7 of Daniel is where the prophetic portion of the book begins. This portion was sealed until the time of the end. And since 1798, God has given much light of understanding to his people concerning these prophecies. We have, we, which we have seen God reveal to Daniel step by step, both future events on earth and in heaven. Amen. And the most beautiful part about it he showed them going on at the same time. He showed what's going on in earth and in heaven, back and forth, to help Daniel understand the context of everything he was seeing. And as Daniel began to be filled up with great emotions, filled with troubling thoughts, seeing the war against God's people, and yet at the very same time, heaven being open before Daniel, and he's seeing the throne of the Ancient of Days, our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, His Son, and our High Priest. The highest of all and the lowest of lows and emotions of such grand proportions filled the mind and life of Daniel. Daniel wrote in verse 15 these words, and I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit and in the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto the one, uh, one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of this. And so he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. 
This one that stood beside him, Daniel was none other than an angel of the Lord. And today we must place ourselves like Daniel to seek God's revelation of these things. For he has promised to reveal as we seek understanding. Amen. But we must ask ourselves some serious questions first. You see, really, how serious are we? We have been, these past few months, as we have been going through this series, verse by verse, chapter by chapter of Daniel, on our way through, have we for ourselves sought God in prayer, pleading for a deeper understanding of His Word? Have we supposed, purposed in our hearts to apply that which God is revealing? Or are we lazily waiting for each Sabbath to come to hear what we have not studied? To hear subjects that we have not looked at for ourselves. You see, if that is our case, then we are in a worse condition than if we had ever, never heard these truths. You see, God wants each of us to be faithful Bereans. Amen. Amen. Studying and applying the Word of God in our personal lives. Yes. Being holy and completely surrendered to His authority. You see, God gave to Daniel all the identifying points needed without reservation to know. What power is referred to when it says this stout little horn is what we are going to be focusing on today. It must be understood its true character of this little horn. It must be seen also in its correct context. What stout little horn, you may ask? Let us turn to Daniel 7. As we open up our Bibles, we will be going to Daniel 7 and verse 20 as we begin there. Like I said, we are going to review just a little bit and then we are going to jump right into 25 through 28. And of the ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before them before whom three fell. Uriah Smith's writing in page 118 and 119 states, Daniel considered the horns. Indications of a strange movement appeared among them. Notice Daniel considered. When Daniel considers, when anyone considers anything, there's time involved. Daniel took some time. He considered and he saw a strange thing going on. A little horn. At first little, but afterward more stout than its fellows. Thrust itself up among them. From even before the ten kingdoms began their destructive powers against the Western Roman Empire. The Roman bishops wanted civil power. And because of this seed of exaltation, wanted nothing to jeopardize that which they were wanting to gain and in strength to obtain. They were going to let nothing get in the way. And as Uriah Smith continues, he says, it was not this little horn content to quietly find its own place and fill it. It must thrust aside some of the others and usurp their places. Three kingdoms were plucked up before it. This little horn as we shall have occasion to notice, 
more fully hereafter, was and is the papacy. The three horns plucked up before it were the Hurliai, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. Last week we ended with this scenario. We ended with understanding that these three countries had rejected the papal theology and position of authority. They were following the theology of Arius and were known as Arians. We dealt with that issue last week a little and we will gain more understanding of it in the future. And the reason why they were plucked up was because they were opposed to the teaching and claims of the papal hierarchy and hence to the supremacy in the church of the Bishop of Rome. And in, his, and in this horn were eyes, eyes like a man and a mouth speaking great things. The eyes, a fit emblem of the shrewdness, penetration, cunning, and foresight of the papal hierarchy. And the mouth, speaking great things, a fit symbol of the arrogant claims of the bishops of Rome. This we have established in the past and are reminded now clearly as the papacy, which received its power and authority from pagan Rome in 538 A.D. Continuing in the descriptiveness, Daniel writes in his last half of verse 20, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. The 1828 dictionary declares, stout as meaning, strong, lusty, bold, intrepid, valiant, brave, large, bulky, proud, resolute, obstinate, many things like this, strong and firm. To establish more distinctly the meaning of stoutness of this little horn, we read J.H. Wagner, E.J. Wagner's father, in the book From Eden to Eden, page 114, these words. Although it arose as a little horn, so it did not at first take its place among the kingdoms of the earth. It became strong, for its look was more stout than its fellows. And it is well so known, it is so well known, that it passes without proof that the Romanist church kingdom became stronger than the strongest kingdoms of the earth. The heads of this system, the popes of Rome claimed it as their right to rule over the kings and to absolve subjects from their allegiance to any king who refused submission to their will. Verse 21 of chapter 7, Daniel says, And I beheld. And the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. For this is why God revealed to Daniel at the same time the work of Jesus Christ as our high priest in heaven. No matter how evil and violent the war against God's people become, we must hold firmly on the assurance of the power we can use from heaven's throne because of the service of our great high priest. Amen. 
For Daniel, his mind was filled with trouble and stress from the scenes he saw transpiring on this earth in the future. Intense, violent destruction of God's people made Daniel shudder. The stoutness of this little horn, its diverseness, is shown clearly by what Uriah Smith wrote on page 140. To parry the force of this damaging testimony from all history. Papists deny that the church has ever persecuted anyone. It, ha it has been the secular power, they say. The church has only passed decision upon the question of heresy. And then turned the offenders to, over to the civil power. To be dealt with according to the pleasure of the secular court. The impious hypocrisy of this claim is transparent enough to make it an absolute insult to common sense. In those days of persecution, what was the secular power? Simply a tool in the hand of the church, under its control, doing it's bidding. Bloody bidding, that is for sure. This war of the dark ages could be expounded upon with many, many volumes of books. And yet, in many cases, all records of the destructions of the people of God was erased by fire so that the spoils could be held by the individual armies and not go to the church power of Rome. Until recent years, this was the papal defense. But it seemed to be even seen in more mainstream. The truth would start to come out. For the Pope asked forgiveness for the heirs of the church over the last 2,000 years. Recorded on March 13th, 2000, Alessandra Stanley wrote in the New York Times these words, quoting Pope John Paul II, saying, we humbly ask forgiveness. John Paul II today delivered the most sweeping papal apology ever. Repenting for the heirs of his church over the last 2,000 years. We cannot recognize the betrayal of the gospel committed by those of our brothers, especially in the second millennium. The Pope, dressed in purple robes for Lent, said in his homily, recognizing the deviations of the past, serves to reawaken our consciences to the compromises of the present. This, in reality, was just a sham. A smokescreen to make the people think that the papacy had changed. Mm -hmm. If sincere confession would have been done, a direct acknowledgement of the sins of the Dark Ages would have been a part of the papal words. But in fact, the papacy has never changed in its character. The words were meant only to gloss over much evil that was spoken of, to bring in a new air of manipulation and control through religious political leadership. It will always gladly encourage others to do the evil for it. Yeah. Hence, the work of the final image to the beast attempts to do what no other beast has ever accomplished, which is recorded in Revelation 13. Of this little horn, thou little horn, we will learn far worse from visions given to Daniel and to John in Revelation. But for today, we stick with the verses of hand, going to verse 25 of Daniel 7, reading, And he shall speak great words 
against the Most High. What, ha what has man been inspired by the great deceiver Satan to say? What words are being daily repeated? The very same words and sentiments of Satan himself. Page 136 of Daniel Revelation, Uriah Smith writes, Has the papacy done this? Yes. Look at self-approved titles of the Pope as Vicegerent of the Son of God, Our Lord God the Pope, Another God upon earth, King of the worlds, King of kings, and Lord of lords. To none can this apply so well or so fitly as to the popes of Rome. They have assumed infallibility, which belongs only to God. Amen. They profess to forgive sins, which only belongs to God. Amen. They profess to open and shut heaven, Amen. which only belongs to God. Amen. They profess to be higher than all the kings of the earth, which belongs only to God. Amen. Here are a few slides of statements that they have made in their own words, in their own magazines and periodicals and statements of fact. The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even the divine law. So. This is taken from the Prabhupada Papa II Volume 6, page 29. A Catholic document. Continuing the... The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ. He is Jesus Christ himself right. hidden under the veil of flesh. Blasphemy is for sure. The Pope and God are the same. So he has all the power in heaven and earth. These are some of the descriptions of who the Pope is in their eyes. Verse 25, second part. And shall what? Wear out the saints of the Most High. Some would today deny this occurring. Some would say that the papacy has never done this. And yet, the record is clear. The papacy has done this. For the mere information of any student of church history, no answer need here be given. All know that for long years the papal church pursued its relentless work against the true followers of God. Wars, crusades, massacres, inquisitions, and persecutions of all kind. These were their weapons of extinction. The warring against the people of God was done with great fury. Weapons of extinction were used to wipe out many villages, whole people groups, who dared to oppose the unbiblical teachings of the papacy. Notice Dowling's History of Romanism, quoted by Smith, describing the effective war that was put against the people of God by the papacy. As the church has ecclesiastical and secular princes who are their, who are her two arms, so has so she has two swords, the spiritual and the material. 
Therefore, when her right arm is unable to convert the heretic with the sword of the spirit, she invokes the aid of the left hand and coerces the heretics with the material sword. In answer to the argument that the apostles never invoked the secular arm against the heretics, he says, the apostles did not because there was no Christian prince whom they could call for aid. But afterward, in Constantine's time, the church called in the aid of the secular arm. Little is ever admitted by the world of the evil world war against God's true and faithful. Yet the monuments are still there in Europe, in the hills and mountains and valleys of Switzerland, where the Waldensians and many others, the Anabaptists, gave their lives for to stand up against the papal system. They kept the true Sabbath, Amen. the seventh day of the week. Amen. They upheld the truth as they knew it. An apostasy in all of them that survives has brought in whole groups of people who have a history that they know not of. The masses have given, been kept in ignorance of the truth of this stout little horn, will suffer even greater things by its effective inspiration to another power which we will learn about when studying Revelation 13. The dark ages, dark because of persecution and death, dark because of educational advancements were held by lock and key by the Bishop of Rome. Dark ages, ever so dark. Yet God had his faithful people willing to face death in this life so that their lives would never deny the word of God in their lives now. Amen. And looked for reward of the crown of eternal life in the future. They did not mind physical pain, for the reward of heaven was on their lips. Page 140, Uriah Smith writes, In corroboration of these facts, 50 million martyrs. This is the lowest computation made by any historian. Notice the lowest computation will rise up in the judgment as witnesses against that church's bloody work. Words fail to portray the reality of this massacre orchestrated by this papal system. We need to remember that this little horn came up out of its pagan beast it represented different things. But one thing we need to understand, the 10 kingdoms, the ten, first 10 horns, were horns that represented kingdoms that took part in the destruction of pagan Rome. But the little horn was diverse because it brought all of pagan Rome into its horn. It utilize all of the understanding, all of the deceptions, all of the sin, everything of the characteristics of pagan Rome, which brought in all of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, all of it into this little horn. Notice as we continue, pagan Rome persecuted relentlessly the Christian church. Yeah. And it is estimated that three million Christians perished in the first 300 years of the Christian church history. Yet, 
It is said that the primitive Christians prayed for continuance from Imperial Rome. For they knew that when this form of government should cease, another far worse persecuting power would arise. Which would literally, as the prophecy declares, wear out the saints of the Most High. Notice the next sentence. Pagan Rome would slay the infants, but spare the mothers. But Papal Rome slew mothers and infants together. No age, no sex, no condition in life was exempt from her relentless a rage. Wow. Continuing with Daniel 7, 25, we read the phrase, this little horn think to change times and laws. What laws? Whose laws? Not the laws of any earthly government. For it was nothing marvelous or strange for one power to change laws of another True. whenever it could bring such power under its dominion? True. Not human laws of any kind for the little horn power to change these so far as its jurisdiction extended. But the times and laws in question were such as this power should only think to change, but not able to change. Amen. They were laws of the same being to whom the saints belong, who are worn out by this power, namely the laws of the Most High. Yeah. It has the papacy, has, and has the papacy attempted this? Yes. Yes. Yes, even this it has. Yes. Notice in its own words again what it states. Sunday is our mark of authority. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church is above the Bible mm -hmm. and this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Anyone worshiping on Sunday is following after the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. That's right. For even the Anabaptists, they would keep Sabbath. Yes, the Waldensians kept the Sabbath. Yes, These are standing rebukes to the so-called Protestant churches who have linked their hand in Catholicism by saying the Sabbath is no longer needed today. They are putting themselves like Roman Catholicism above the Bible. The Catholic Press, August 25th, 1900. Sunday is a Catholic institution and can be defended only by what? Catholic, Catholic, Catholic principles. That's true. As we continue. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and the dividing of time. How long a time will they be given power into the hands of this power? A time as we have seen from chapter 4 verse 23 is one year. Two times at least could be denoted by the plural two years. The dividing of time, or half a time, a half a year. 
we must now consider that we are in the midst of symbolic prophecy. Hence, in this measurement, the time is not literal, but also symbolic. The inquiry then arises. How long a period is denoted by three and a half prophetic time? The rule is given us in the Bible. Amen. Amen. That when a day is used as a symbol, it stands for a year. Amen. Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34. We will not read them, but please mark them in your notes. Read them, for it truly and clearly says that a day for a year is how it should be read. Yes. The ordinary Jewish year, which must be used as the basis of reckoning, contained 360 days. Right. Three and one half years contains 1260 days. Each day stands for a year. We have 1260 years for the continuation of the supremacy of this horn. Did the papacy possess dominion that length of time? Yes, the answer is unequivocally, yes, it did. We must understand it clearly. Uriah Smith lays it out without clearly so far distinctly that it cannot be under any kind of controversy. History has completely fulfilled this prophecy. The papacy is a stout little horn with an evil history and its character has never changed. Praise God we are not left at this junction of the prophecy but encouraging words now come from God's throne. Uriah Smith writing, after describing the terrible career of the little horn and stating that the saints will be given into his hands for 1260 years, bringing us down to 1798, verse 26 declares this, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Here we will, when studying Revelation 13, we will understand clearly that God reveals the papacy will never arise again to be the persecuting power of the past. But we will see another yet even more base and evil power than the papacy take its place as the persecutor of God's people. And though this little horn power domination ended in 1798, it was allowed to be restored strictly as a religious power without civil strength as before. Now instead of force, the papacy is sought after, wandered after, thought to be God on earth yes. by most of professed Christianity. Yes. Yet its character has never changed. Its intents are the same. The destruction of God's truth throughout the world. Now it openly declares that the fundamental belief in the scriptures as being hostile to their form of Christianity. Yes. And yet once again, God shifts the focus of Daniel in verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Amen. After all the suffering, 
God's people are restored to the dominion of this earth. But not as a sin-cursed earth, but a redeemed, pure earth of joy and love. Uriah Smith on page 148 declares, after beholding the dark and desolate picture of papal oppression upon the church, the prophet is permitted once more to turn his eyes. Praise the Lord. Daniel was suffering greatly with mental anguish mm -hmm. over what he saw. He loved the people of God. We know that because when we get to his prayer in Daniel 9, we will see and understand how much he loved the people of God. Mm -hmm. He hated to see this desolation against the people. The destructive work. But God turns his eyes upon the glorious period of the saints rest Amen. when they shall have the kingdom free from all oppressive powers Amen. in everlasting possession how could the children of God keep heart in this present evil world amid the misrule and oppression of earth of governments of earth and the abominations that are done in the land if they could not look forward to the kingdom of God and the return of their Lord with full assurance that the promises concerning them both shall be certainly fulfilled and certainly done speedily. Amen. It's the only way you have hope. The only way you can keep your sanity is to know that our Lord and Savior shall return. Amen. Notice how Daniel records the effect of all these visions so far in Daniel 7. And we should ask ourselves the question, shouldn't it be this way with us? And if it's not, let us get on our knees. For Daniel said, hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cognizance much troubled me. My countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Daniel 7. Together we've seen things that we've maybe never seen before. In much clearer and distinct light from God. God gave Daniel visions of both earth and heaven at the same time. Yes. Repeatedly, God encouraged Daniel by the work of heaven. While revealing some of the most frightful, evil things anyone could ever imagine. Stephen Haskell writes in his book, Story of Daniel, on page 118, these words as we close. Sin with all who have clung to it will be forever destroyed. The pride and arrogance of Babylon of old, her iniquity from every form which has been repeated by all the nations of the earth, together with the instigator of all evil, will at last be blotted out. Oh, yes. The end of the controversy is reached. The triumph of truth is witnessed by all created beings. The scar which sin has made is gone forever. Amen. The discord which for 6,000 years has marred the universe is forgotten. The music of the spheres is taken up anew, and man reigns with his creator. Hitherto is the end of the matter. Oh, yes. Praise the Lord. What a wonder that the vision troubled Daniel, and that his countenance changed. 
the matchless love of Christ. Who can understand it? God had changed Daniel's focus forever. Amen. His countenance changed forever. His mind holds revelations of God's throne that capture his attention and he sees the end of all sin. And when we begin as Daniel did here, recorded in chapter 7, when we find our hearts affected by the pure love of God, when we allow ourselves to completely trust God in everything, even in the most difficult things of life, when we only trust Him, He'll provide the answers. Amen. Let us listen. For He will, by His Spirit, will say, this is the way, walk ye therein. Amen. Or we will think and we will know where to walk. God has made the pathway. The question is, will we be willing to walk by His Spirit the narrow pathway upward? Frivolous will not be our lives in anything, but holy we will lean on Jesus. Amen. For He is our, the only and true way. In Him and He in us is our only hope for glory and eternal life. Amen. It is our only real way to have peace in our life Amen. with all the chaos that goes around us, with all the frivolous and carelessness of this life around us. Trust Him. Only trust Him. Amen. What a solemn thought Daniel leaves us with. Will you see heaven from heaven's perspective? Or will you keep your head down in discouragement? Will you gain the joy of knowing the end? It doesn't matter how much suffering you have to go through. When you know the end. Amen. True. Amen. There's a hell to shun. Okay. And a heaven to win. Amen. And when we stand on the sea of glass. Crowns on our head. A harp in our hand. We will say. Heaven is cheap enough. Oh, what a solemn thought hmm. that God is in control. Amen. Amen. Let us be like Daniel. That as we gain the visions that Daniel has seen, we conclude with Daniel 7, but there's Daniel 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The scenes will get wonderful more and more detailed. So clearly that no one can fail to understand. They just look and listen to the Word of God. Amen. But will it change you? The only way it can change you is when you look up. Amen. And see how everything that's going on down here, there's something going on up in heaven Amen. corresponding. That has a much glorious end. A much glorious end. Amen. Let us resolve in our hearts to be fully surrendered to God's authority. That we allow God to do whatever it takes to save us. There's nothing in this world that matters that is worth losing our soul salvation. So let us obey the word of the Lord and follow God and not man. Amen. Let us pray.
our loving, merciful, and gracious Father in heaven. As your people have heard, may your spirit teach. And our minds will be full of thy word and nothing of man's. Magnify thyself in these words spoken. Transform our lives and our characters that we may rightly represent you in all things as we go through our lives day by day. We seek the light of your throne around us, your angels to protect us, as we seek to express the visions of heaven and its authority for all who would listen to accept the real Jesus Christ Amen. and their characters to be transformed. That like Paul, we can become the ambassadors for Christ, not a false ambassador, but a true ambassador. We, these things we ask and we plead. In the name of Jesus, for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.